Thanks, Mark. I appreciate you keeping it short. Well, thank you, Mark, uh, for keeping it short. Uh, it really is a privilege to be back here, ladies and gentlemen. As a result of some of those quotes, uh, it's a privilege to be invited to speak in front of any uh, polite company anymore. <laughs> and so uh, here you get invited back to your hometown. Uh, and I, I've in the last uh, year or two, I, I've spoken to presidents and kings. I've testified in front of the Senate, but this will be the toughest group I've ever been around because <laughs> sitting in front of me is my 93-year-old mother, and believe me, she would have been forgiven. <laughs> she could have been forgiven had she drowned me at birth for all the gray hairs I was given her. But I uh, would also, uh, Madam President, I would just point out that it, it uh, with Rotary 110 years old, uh, I love Rotary because number one, it was kind of born in the West. We don't think of Chicago anymore as the West, but it was the West in the 100, over 100 years ago. And it's first, the, the chapters after that were in places like San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, and eventually a place called Winnipeg. I see the Canadian flag up here and my grandfather uh, had a, it served actually uh, in the Canadian Army, was in the hospital there after World War I. So around Rotary, I really do feel uh, right at home. And I would also tell you, and we got a young man able to skip some school here, Jonathan, well done. I would have done the same thing if I could have gotten out of class in those days. <laughs> but uh, he's thinking about joining the Marines. And I would just tell you that uh, the focus on ethics that Rotary Club brings, I think is essential for y our younger generation where so many people appear to be ashamed to even talk about ethics anymore. And we've got coaches here like Ben Jacobs, the best baseball coach in Washington State, who tried to impart not just how you, de how you bring up kids in this town the way he and I were brought up by that World War II uh, generation to play sports and that sort of thing, but also with the uh, with the values that I was brought up with that served me so well and armed me for a world that I had no idea, Jonathan, when I was your age, that it would, I would eventually wander uh, around in. Uh, what I thought I would do after talking to several people beforehand is talk about the cross currents in this area. The idea being that if you understand the cross currents, when you read the newspaper, or you watch the news on TV, you might be able to put things in a little better context. Frankly, as a military person over this last dozen years of fighting, uh, I've been amazed at how the American people have stuck with the military, considering how poorly explained the wars have been to all of you, that the, that the wars have not been put in a context. We don't have FDR doing his fireside chats. We don't have John F. Kennedy saying, we're gonna have to get together and, and do what you can for your country. We're in a tough situation. And so I want to try and put this in some, some degree of intellectual construct for you. Uh, and the cross currents here are maddening. I'm going to tell you right up front, I've dealt with the area since 1979. I've dealt with this enemy since then. And the cross currents are complex. I do owe you, uh, I wasn't in the Marine Corps for 40 years. I was in the US Marine Corps. And I owe you for the tuition you paid for my education. I'm also, as a U.S. Marine, accountable to you, so if what we did out there cannot be explained and, and justified to you, then we've got a bigger problem. So I'm also here to justify at least part of what we've done out there. The ethnic rivalries that are played out here are significant. You're watching it right now with ISIS, where they've run into an ethnic barrier called the Kurds. There you see the Arab-Kurd uh, uh, problem, and I'm gonna grab the, uh, the pointer here. And what you see right up in, uh, hmm. you 
You know, high technology had its drawbacks, doesn't it? Well, if you look up in northern Iraq, what you're seeing up there is the Kurdish area. And when ISIS, the Arabs, came up there, ah, there we go. Thanks, young lady, appreciate that. And what you see uh, when, let me find the right country, right up in here, you have Kurds living in Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria, okay? They don't have their own country. They're one of the largest peoples in the world without their own country. So as ISIS came steaming up here in Iraq using the resentment of the Sunnis against the Shia government, another cleavage point, they ran into it. What kind of groups are out there? You have Kurdish and you've got Arab. You've got Persian here and you've got Turkmen up here. And it all comes together mixed up like a mishmash right there. You've got religious rivalries between religions out here, ladies and gentlemen, and even inside religions. You all know the ones like the Muslim the, uh, and the Jew, the Christian and the Druze. Then it, you come down here into Egypt and you have Coptic Christians and Sunnis, uh, that sort of thing. But there is a, I would just tell you that there's a, probably the strongest religious rivalry we have out there across current is the Sunni Shia with inside Islam. Islam has what we call bloody innards, okay? And then you've got the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Here you have another people uh, in an area where the modern state of Israel was carved out who do not have their own land, do not have their own country, and it's become somewhat of a frozen conflict. It, if you solve this today, it would not solve all the problems in the Middle East. At the same time, it does keep the heat on and the boiling going on there uh, in this area and causes the enemy terrorists a lot of recruitment, money, and, and people. And then you've got another cross current called the reformers and the authoritarians. Now you saw it played out when the Arab Spring broke out. And there you saw in Libya, the reformers wanted to get rid of Gaddafi. Uh, the place has gone, as you know, very much downhill since Gaddafi left in terms of chaos but you saw it played out there. In Syria, you see the reformers wanted to get rid of Assad. Most of them, by the way, are now dead. Uh, they've been killed by either Assad's forces or by the jihadists who have come in, the, the radicals who have come in. But you also see it played out in, in places down here in the Sunni monarchies down in this area, uh, Yemen being an exception. Uh, so here's another cross current and the reason I want to bring these up is we are Americans we thought well when the Arab Spring broke out guess what they're all Russian for democracy right well many young Arabs wanted democracy as the way to see their way forward for their futures but guess what uh, after that kind of a revolution in an area that had not had democracy ever uh, it was really a flight away from unjust, unresponsive regimes in Egypt, in Libya, in Tunisia, where it all started, in Yemen, in, in a number of areas, Syria. It, it, was a, it was a flight from something. It was not a rush towards something. So now, guess what you have? You once again have authoritarian in Syria, Assad, with Iran's help, dominating. You've got the militias out here. We all know in history that if anyone thought this was going to be a smooth cruise into democracy, they probably hadn't read their history books. That's the bottom line. Now, you put all these cross currents together, and I would just tell you that you will find yourself at times making cause with people you don't have a lot in common with. In other words, you make cause here because you must. It's pragmatic. Or you make cause here because they're not against you on this issue but it doesn't mean that they're for us. I've, I had to testify in front of the Senate a couple months, a uh, month and a half ago, and I said, you know, the enemy of your enemy can still be your enemy. You know, some people come up with these little aphorisms that, oh, the enemy of your enemy is your friend. Not always. Sometimes they're not, I'll get into this. But what, here's what it does. When you're sitting in Tri-Cities, Washington, reading the newspaper, it gets more and more maddening as you try to figure out which side we're on in any one of these cleavage plates. That's the way it is. I had a, the former UK prime minister, I went to see him in my last job because he was one of the, the most studied uh, men on this issue, on these issues here, this region. 
And he says, look, Jim, if you can't ride two horses in the circus, get out of the circus. Welcome to reality. And he was absolutely right. He wasn't making a, a joke. He wasn't being glib. The reality is America is a combination of idealism and pragmatism. And to keep the idealism alive, we don't want to give up our, our pragmatism. And sometimes that makes for very awkward, very, very awkward alliances for us. I would tell you that the one cross current that is currently bedeviling us all, no matter who you are in the region or in tri-cities and elsewhere, is the violent jihadist terrorist. And those come in two varieties, and it's good to look at the two. Now, one of them you know very well, Al-Qaeda, uh, Al-Qaeda associated movements, they attacked us on 9-11, blew up our embassies in uh, East Africa. They've, uh, they've manifested uh, out here, they've, they've franchised, they're called uh, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, Boko Haram, uh, and uh, probably just cooling off a little bit there. There we go, maybe. Um, they've, uh, you, you've got uh, Al-Shabaab down here, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. This group here in Yemen is targeted directly on America. They fight their others down there, but these are the ones who tried to bring down the airliner over Detroit. Of course, you got Al Nusra front here, and now ISIS in this area, and uh, you've got the Al Qaeda, the main people, the guys who attacked us on 9/11. They declared war on us in the mid 90s. Uh, they've not backed off. They've been hurt up in this area. They've been badly hurt uh, by our anti-terrorist, counter-terrorist campaign but they have franchised, they are stronger today than 10 years ago. That's the bottom line. And anyone who told you after Osama bin Laden, after we got him, they were going to go away, they, they were unfortunately just living in a dream world. Uh, none of the intelligence people, the CIA said that's absolutely not the case. They knew exactly what was going to happen. Uh, so mid 90s, declare war on America. Uh, they try to bring down the trade towers twice. They succeed the second time. You know them well, badly hurt, but franchising. Then you've got the one that is even more serious, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of a long-term threat. And that is, it, you call them Lebanese Hezbollah here in Lebanon, where they're basically a, a, a counter to the Lebanese government. Lebanese government can do nothing without the Iranian-sponsored Lebanese Hezbollah giving them permission to do it. They're fighting in Syria. And they're now, the Lebanese, the uh, Iranian-sponsored militias are now fighting in Iraq uh, against ISIS. And they are all supported of, out of Iran, which is the number one destabilizing influence in the Middle East. This terrorist group has longer-term threat to the United States and our interests than ISIS. And so it, it, my point to you is here, that this is a problem that is not going to go away once we address ISIS. And, and so the laser-like focus on ISIS is actually inappropriate if you are trying to solve this problem. You need an integrated approach to all of this area so that you're not solving one problem only to create another problem that you have to deal with a year later. And we have unfortunately done that uh, several times. The Lebanese Hezbollah, by the way, declared war on us in 1983. Uh, that's when they blew up our embassy in Beirut. Uh, they blew up uh, the French paratrooper and the U.S. Marine peacekeeper barracks there in Beirut, and they've been at it ever since. Uh, they murdered Israeli terrorists or uh, tourists up in Bulgaria uh, here a couple years ago. Believe it or not, they actually uh, tried to kill the Saudi Arabian ambassador to Washington, D.C in Georgetown on a Saturday night at a very popular restaurant. Had they, but for one fundamental mistake they made, they would have pulled it off. And if they had done so, there would have been hundreds of Americans dead and wounded. And the least of our concerns would be right now negotiations with Iran. That's the, that's the reason though, that kind of conduct is the reason why you see so much attention to their nuclear capability. If they would do this without a nuclear weapon, what would they feel free to do had they a nuclear weapon to hide behind? So that's, that's why you see uh, what's going on with the uh, nuclear negotiations. We can talk about that in the Q&A. ISIS itself, this very uh, barbaric band, uh, they're a natural outgrowth of the regional fighting 
It's the normal maturation of terrorism. They always become more terroristic, ladies and gentlemen, because if they don't, then the tough guys will always go to the, the tougher outfit and they'll lose their recruits. So there's always this effort to try and create a more and more barbaric unit. For those of you who remember the troubles in Ireland, the IRA were followed by what? The Provo IRA. If you look at South Africa and what they went through, you saw the same sort of thing. In the midst of all this, let me just back off for a minute now. Those are the cross currents I wanted to mention to you and hopefully help guide some of your questions today. Uh, but we'll, we'll go wherever you want to go on the Q&A. In the midst of all this, the Western democracies are fundamentally rudderless. I mean, that is simply a reality. We have to recognize it because if you don't recognize a problem, especially you young people in a room can't, can't align your thinking in a way that says, what are you going to do about it? You've got to define the problem. We are unable, Western democracies, whether it be in Europe or in America, to keep our fiscal houses in order. Uh, and by the way, no country in history has maintained its military capability if it didn't keep its fiscal house in order. Always for America, our economy has been what's driven our military strength. We could always turn to it to build what we needed to, to get the capabilities we needed. Uh, we have now a government in Washington, D.C. and in many of the European capitals unable uh, or unwilling to compromise and to find any fundamental unity. Uh, and this political malaise at home is leaking right over here. I was with a crown prince who, who uh, runs his country out here. Uh, his father has deferred most of the day-to-day -day running to him. And he was beside himself saying, you know, you guys are supposed to be a superpower. You don't act like it. We have no idea what you want today. And part of the challenge is, ladies and gentlemen, I had 19-year-old Lance Corporals who were more articulate about, what, about the nobility of what we were fighting for out there than many of the alleged spokesmen in Washington, D.C. And rest assured, this is heavily a war of ideas. And those ideas you and I grew up with, and we take them, as, uh, as some of the uh, speakers have said, Mark said, we take them sometimes for granted, the, these, these freedoms. Uh, but we were born free by accident, most of us here in this country. I was born in Pullman. I lived here, uh, we all live here by, by choice. So we're born free, you know, by accident. We live free by choice, but we have an obligation to turn over to this younger generation the same freedoms we enjoyed. And right now, when you look at America, uh, it seems to be unable to take its own side on, on occasion in a, in a fight. And I think that if you look at the greatest generation, the, the generation that came home from World War II, uh, they looked around and said 60, 70 million, nobody can even count the number of dead and the amount of suffering in that war. But they said, that's a pretty crummy world, we have to do something about it. And what they did with it, with that world was, they created the UN, so a place to, where they can talk over problems. I mean, before the UN there was nothing, basically. League of Nations had failed. They created the Marshall Plan. They said that vindictive treaty that contributed to starting World War II after World War I, the Versailles Treaty, didn't make World War II, but it certainly contributed. We're not gonna do that. We're actually going to help our enemies. Think about that. We're going to help our enemies, and a couple years after we've been killing each other in the Pacific and in Europe, Americans take money out of their pockets and start their economies, and guess where our biggest trading partners are now? So they had that sort of maturity, that sort of compassion, that sort of strategic foresight. They also uh, created NATO. They recognized that they weren't going to stand there and watch the Soviet Union put us right back in the same position. And they banded together, and those people who believed in the values that grew out of the Enlightenment, that grew out of the Reformation, that got voice in our Constitution, that we were going to defend them, and we did it in a way that, generally speaking, we can say there was no major war that brought down the Soviet Union. We contained them until the internal frictions took the Soviet Union down. And that was what they were doing. They created Bretton Woods. You know it as the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank. Help people. Loan money to people who then pay it back, but they get the starter capital they need to create wealth and lift people out of poverty. That international order worked, and today it's like in Washington, D.C., there is no governing going on. There's no real 
bipartisan engagement and that international system, so to speak, that we put together at such cost, we are assuming that it's self-sustaining. It's not self-sustaining. We're going to have to do something because they knew that no nation is an island. Coming home from World War II and what they had been through, they were committed that we, the younger generation, would not grow up in this acting like we don't have to pay attention to the rest of the world. And that is a, that is a lesson that I worry about because today we have a strategic atrophy in Washington, D.C. We're in a strategy-free zone. I cannot tell you that we have an integrated regional strategy to deal with it. And let me explain uh, the most fundamental question we have to ask. Uh, is political Islam in our best interest? We, don't, we won't even ask the question. Now, the president of this country, an Arab Muslim, he'll ask the question, and he thinks political Islam is, is crazy. <laughs> president al-Sisi has come out and He's berated his own clerics and said, you have a problem. You're getting the whole world aligned against our religion with your crazy talk. That is wrong. Now, if he can bring up political Islam, and if United Arab Emirates can do so, why can't we bring it up in the country where the free competition of ideas is what we're built on? You've got to wonder about that sort of thing and say that lacking a coherent strategy you can send all the brave young lance corporals you want out here to fight wars. You can spend all your taxpayers' money. And without a strategy, there is no, no hope whatsoever that we are going to somehow find our way out of this. And at a time when we need more allies than ever, we seem to be applying a standard now that unless you're a perfect nation, we're going to take you publicly out and humiliate you with reports we put out about what you're doing here on these rights for uh, the, this minority or, or some other group. Now, don't get me wrong. We should speak quite adequately about what we stand for. And Rotary Club that was built on the idea that you would not have racial lines and by the 1920s that you would have women as members and, and all these kind of things. Rotary Club is an example of where you can have these kind of civil societies and all. We should be very proud of who we are, but it doesn't mean we go to a country and say, if you're not where we're at, or if you're not where Great Britain is 800 years after the Magna Carta, we're not going to stand with you. When your neighbor's house is on fire, FDR said, you, bring, you, you loan him your hose. You don't get into a long discussion about whether or not women should have the right to drive in the streets of Saudi Arabia. Now, you and I believe they should, <clears throat> and by the way, the king who just passed away the king once told me the only way to improve driving in Riyadh, is co in country's capital, would be to give women driver's license because the men were such crummy drivers. <laughs> so this is not a king who's not aware of what, what he's trying to change, but he's got to deal with all, you know, all politics are local, you know, in Tri-Cities and in Riyadh. And right now, he's decided the best way around it was that he is giving full free ride scholarships to a hundred thousand young Saudis every year to go to college in the United Kingdom or America. Now you know how powerful education is. You know darn good and well what the king is up to to make change inside his society while dealing what he and I used to go like this and we were both talking about the bearded ones. They, these guys who, not to hold beards against anybody by the way, but, but <laughs> my point is he has to deal, he has to deal with some real fundamentalist religious strains over in this part of the world. And you can't deal with it all the time like the Marines. I remember walking up behind some Marines in a heck of a firefight in Ramadi, and uh, they were, we had a dozen Marines and a sailor shooting down the street, and the bad guy shooting back at us. I walked and said, hey, I asked the single dumbest question that's ever been asked in 239 years of illustrious Marine Corps history. I said, hey guys, what's going on? <laughs> And the corporal who was leading them looked over at me, uh, convinced that some village somewhere had lost its duty idiot. <laughs> he said, well, General, we're just taking the fun out of fundamentalism over here. <laughs> That's one way to do it, and there's nothing wrong with a 21-year-old corporal leading his teenage Marines into a fight with that. But you need a little more sophisticated understanding. And if you walk a mile in their shoes, you realize not everybody over there is bad. The only reformist tendencies there are are right here in the monarchies. That's the only reformist tendencies we have over there. 
and they are worth standing with us. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States is going to need allies more than ever. We have shrunk our military beyond what our strategy calls for. In other words, we have a mismatch. We've said we're allied with Japan, South Korea, NATO. We've made these alliances. We don't have enough troops anymore to live up to our word. And people are starting to doubt they can count on America. That was one thing the greatest generation was never doubted about, that they would stand by their word. The Australian ambassador once told me that the most, the single most sacrificial act in world history was in 1950 or thereabouts when we set up NATO and the Americans said, we will commit 100 million dead Americans with NATO to free Europe, to keep it free. Think about it. We didn't need Europe at that point. We could have created our markets in Latin America and Asia. We stuck with them. We created NATO. And we were willing to commit that many casualties in a, in a nuclear war. So you've got nations that look to us for that kind of leadership. And the more leadership we show, the less of our military do we have to have carrying the burden because they will be with us. In Afghanistan, 50 nations were with us. Largest wartime coalition in modern world history. And they were there because we were there. When I, we had a problem, the French and the British had to pull their troops out of Afghanistan for domestic political reasons. And the United Arab Emirates called me up said, we understand that you've got to pull your troops out, or the French and British troops out. He said, so you don't have to go and ask for more troops from the Americans. They said, we're going to send you more fighter aircraft and more special forces. That's the United Arab Emirates. And here's when they've been with us. Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Kosovo, Bosnia, Somalia, Afghanistan, Libya. Every time we called them, the country we call Little Sparta in the U.S. military stands with us. I flew from there. I was in uh, another country out there. I flew down to see the King of Jordan about his refugee problem up here coming out of Syria. And the bottom line was we got done and we're sitting there. I've known the king since he was a crown prince. I said, what's it like to be a king? I've never been one. You know, kind of, what will you do? You know? And he went over some of the things he was dealing with. And he said, by the way, he said, I understand that some of your allies had to pull their troops out. I said, yes, that, yeah, that's exactly what happened, Your Majesty. And he said, well, let me reassure you on one thing. He said, my Jordanian soldiers will stay in Afghanistan until the last American soldier comes home. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you can't buy allies like that. You need allies in this world. And I have fought many times for this country. I have never fought in an all-American formation. There were always Arabs or Afghans or any of those other 50 countries uh, standing there around me and losing, by the way, their boys just like we were losing ours. And I would just tell you there's three reasons to stay engaged out here. One is economic. Even if North America is energy independent in a couple of years, our markets are not. And the price of this globally traded oil will be set at, at the pump by the Mideast. It's 40% of the oil comes out of there. You can imagine what that means. And from immediately from New York to California, from Seattle to Miami, we would feel it if that oil got cut off immediately. That, there's no, we don't live as an island in a globally connected world. Second point is diplomatically, we need friends. And as you watch Russia uh, with the worrisome activities it's got going on, as you watch what's going on in South China Sea, we need friends, and you can't have friends if you don't stand with them when they're in trouble, if you want them to be with you when you're in trouble. And a third point is security. We don't need to rediscover 9-11 one more time because we decided to try and deal with it back here. Uh, you've got to deal with it at its origins in a globally connected world. So I hope this is some help to put a rather depressing area in context. Uh, I would tell you that when I was there in 1979, first sailed into those waters. Uh, I was an infantry company commander, and I remember one night as we were getting sweating, we were throwing stuff on board helicopters, and we were going back out to the ships. And I remember looking around saying, I am never coming back to this crazy part of the world. <laughs> you have to be very careful in the Naval Service to tell the Commandant of the Marine Corps what you're never going to do, I guarantee you. So let me stop there.